All right, Father in heaven, as we proceed, I pray again, Lord, for your continued blessing. Keep us sound in the faith, alive in the spirit, and with a love for the kingdom of God, a love for your holiness, a love for the presence of the Lord, that we would love to learn of you. I pray, Lord, that we would all, that the church of Jesus Christ, love the sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Turning now to our next verse, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, when he says this. It says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. This is such a blessing, is it not? This is what should comfort us. To realize that God Almighty, by the work of Jesus Christ, by the one offering, has taken their sins. Whose sins? Who has he been talking about all along? The brethren. Those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's the other part? And believed on his name. What is believing? Hebrews chapter 11 is going to cover that. What believing looks like. Many people just say, yeah, that's faith. Oh, I got the faith. Oh, I'm a person of strong faith. But faith can be seen and will be showing up in your life. And here's an example that you receive and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more is also referencing the prophet Jeremiah. In the same section that we just covered, he now says in Jeremiah 31, 34, the next verse. He says this, Jeremiah 31, 34. 34, he writes this, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. It says in Psalm 103, 12, he says this, and you've probably heard it and used this, reference this verse. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What is he doing? He's separating you from the sin that so easily ensnares us. Have you ever noticed that sin has a way of ensnaring you and I? Where your sin and my sin, your sin can ensnare you and my sins can so easily ensnare me. And yet yours doesn't bother me one bit. I'm not tempted, it doesn't bother me. But yet yours is so easy. Do you ever notice that we all have our, what's it, like a personal relationship with sin? Everybody says you have to have a personal relationship with God. Sure, so true. But you notice you also have a personal relationship with your own personal sin. Sin housed within this body. Sin crying and whining and pining and demanding and commanding. And I want to be this. I want to be liked. I want to be cool. I want to be this. Why does it have to be this way? Just the other day, uh, well, I say the other day, a year ago, my eight-year-old grandson, he was seven at the time, and he was outside playing all day long, and, and it was cold, one of those cold fall days this time last year, and he's playing in the creek, and he got wet, and he's cold, and, and to the point that he like, had a hard time moving his fingers, but he had a great time. But he comes in, and, and so Sarah, my daughter, says, why don't you go upstairs and take a nice shower? So all of a sudden, I'm walking by the shower door, and I hear the shower starting off, and all of a sudden, he's in the shower, and he's going, oh! Why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to be this way? Oh, it, is, oh, it hurts. What was going on? The hot shower on the cold body, right, was, was killing him. Why does it have to be this way? Why is it? That's the flesh nature crying out to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Why does it have to be this way? Why do I? Do I do? Oh, it hurts. And that's what people are doing all the time. When all of a sudden you yield and you get used to that hot shower, it's like, ah, <laughs> right? Ah, <laughs> that's right, yeah, a little, a little, a little bit more, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're no longer whining and crying. Why does it have to be this way? Oh, it hurts. Because you're not yet adjusted to the truthfulness of the Holy Spirit. You're not yet adjusted to the holiness. You're not walking in the new relationship with Christ yet. So it's still stinging and hot and you don't like it. When in actuality, wouldn't you just not get out of the lukewarm and get into the hot? Once all of a sudden you realize the Spirit is moving, like you're comfortable there. That's what He's doing in our life. He's, re he's cutting you away from the transgressions. What's He say? I will, I will 
I will remember them no more. I'm cutting you away from your sin. I'm cutting you away from this body of death. What did Paul say about this body of death? Remember he referenced it and he calls it, this body, he calls it a body of death. A temporal body saturated with sin, always demanding, whining and crying to have itself satisfied and soothed in some way. And your soul uses it in order to get all of the things that it desires. So that's why what does the, what does the Bible say to do with this body and this natural life? He says, cut it away, crucify mortify, consider it a living sacrifice. Stop serving self, but instead serve the Spirit. Serve your new life. Give yourself to it. Yield to Him. Surrender to it. Love surrendering. Now I remember my life as I came to know the Lord. The last thing Gary Cody wanted to do is surrender to anybody. I was not of the surrendering kind. I was not built to surrender. I was, I was built by pride. I, I was a fortress ready for a fight. I was going to get, no one's going to take advantage of me. And I made sure of it. Nobody fought, stressed. And all of a sudden, what? The Holy Spirit comes into your life, and what's He want you to do? That's not a comfortable thing for a guy who doesn't give in to serve. All of a sudden, it's just, you start releasing, and you start becoming the man you always wanted to be. You start becoming the person you wanted to be. You start all of a sudden receiving what you always wanted to be. And, and, and all of a sudden you find that I, I gained victory by surrender. I gained life by dying. I gained new life by dying to self. And you release yourself to it. That's the sanctifying work of the Spirit. His love comes into your life. And His love empowers you with a power that has no weapon formed against it. That's what we're talking about. So what is the fault now? Well, what, what, what is the problem? Like if, if he's cast all my sins away and there's no more sin to deal with, but there's still this natural death and natural sin and natural transgression. And so what is the job of the Spirit? It's to cut you away. But if you give yourself to it, then you gave yourself to it and are no longer in Christ, but are now serving self. Therefore, you get that just, to, just to ends. You get that, you reap. You sow to the flesh, you will reap. Destruction. You can sow to the, to the Spirit, reap everlasting life. That's it. He's made it so simple. It's an issue of surrender. So now, what does He call us to do? Do you remember our previous teaching when it said, Hear Him? You now live by the Spirit. In the previous teachings under Hebrews, He said, Now you must hear Him. You come to a place where you hear the Lord, you hear the Spirit, you walk in the Spirit. Now don't say that you walk in the Spirit and you don't know what the Spirit is saying. Because everything He says is right here. And everything he tells you will be in submission and subservient to the Word of God. Yes? Must know the Word. Must know the Spirit of the Word. You know, when we send the kids to children's church, you hear me say all the time, and I've said always in time past, we're not sending them there to hear the stories. We're sending them there to know the faith that's in those stories. Well, in the same way, you don't want to just know the Bible. You want to know the one who wrote the Bible in the context of how he revealed who he is. You want to know his judgments and you want to execute those judgments in your own life. You want his decisions to work in your own life. You want your decisions to be in alignment with his decisions. For surely this life is passing away. As a flower fades, as the grass withers and the flower fades, come to this place of realizing that all of it is passing away. I was, I was once a young guy. I was once spry, like running around, jumping, doing all kinds of things, working all day long. I could work in the hay fields. I was there 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, um, 5 o'clock milking the cows. I'd be out all day long in the hay fields, hot sun, 100 degrees, throwing bales up onto the truck. I worked all day long. Today I'd be dead by 9. Come to realize that I'm not the guy, not the spry young guy anymore. Body fails. But what should be going on inside? The Spirit of God keeps refreshing and renewing and inspiring. And you start coming to realize who you are in the Lord and you, you draw closer to the promise. And, and even today, I, today I got up a, a day closer to the promise of God. Whether the Lord you give me 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, or one year, Lord, closer to the promise of God. Coming and moving and realizing when my faith becomes sight. What about you? Stirring. You want that stirred in you. You want the joy. You want the peace. You want the love. And more than you just don't ask for it to come, you pursue it. That's why the Bible says pursue love. Pursue holiness. Go after it. But how do you go after it if you don't know what it is? How do I know what it is? It's right here. He'll show you what is godly, what is holy, what is unholy, what is faith, what's not faith. Coming to realize that it's worth it going after. And Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. Paul said this, 
speaking at the, uh, at, uh, in Athens at the Areopagus, and they all gathered to question him. And he says this, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now, a command has come forth, but now commands all men everywhere to do what? Repent. Repent. Can't get away from it. Why, why does God keep bringing this up? This turning away from evil and turning to the... Repent. Repent from your evil ways. Repent. How can you repent if you don't know what's evil? People don't want to know what's evil today because they don't want to repent. Come into this place of knowing that God Almighty has called us to repent. And he says that in time past he ignored it. In their inner, ignore, God overlooked it. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who has he has ordained Christ Jesus himself he has given assurance to this of all by raising him from the dead come into this place that God Almighty overlooked in time past but now is commanding everyone everywhere to do what repent 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 from your own selfish ways turn to his love Repent and become one with God. Repent from this old lustful life that just wants to be liked and loved by people and come to be liked and loved by God Almighty. The one that you cannot see is the one you live for, the one that loves you. That's who you go for. That's who you chase. That's what you want in the living God. Turning now to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 18. He says this, Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. God has removed... The sin, the hindrance, the barrier, that which was that he would turn away from, no sin, no flesh could dwell. He, there was nothing, there was no, no way that we could become one with God, no way, no truth, no life. There was no bridge, there was no ability, it was cut off. But God Almighty has a remission of the sins, so there now is no longer a need for any offerings. Christ has died, paid the price, he became sin, and therefore it is no longer the issue a barrier, an obstacle, a hindrance between God and man. That has been satisfied where? In Christ Jesus. Once for all. Now, how do I handle this? Now you do the same thing. Give your body like he did. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself and follow him. Do the same thing. How can I do that? He gave you his Holy Spirit to do it. He gave you his Holy Spirit. So that you can deny yourself in your own will, in your own ways. And then you realize that I want God in my life. And is, or unless you want to be like Esau, which by the way is coming up shortly. Where in the book of Hebrews he references Esau and says unless you're like that profane one Esau, I don't want to be Esau. I want to be Jacob who pursued the living God, the promises of God. All of this now is in the new covenant. There's no longer an offense that's been hindering your relationship with the Lord. Well, then how do I have a relationship with the Lord? He said, hear him. Hear the Spirit. Hear the Word of God. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Go by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Desiring the things of the Spirit. Because those who are Christ belong, have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires, as he says in Galatians 5. You now, if you live in the Spirit, so walk in the Spirit. Is that what he also says in Galatians 5? If you have so received Christ, the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. You now hear, you now know, you now receive, and you walk in His love. And you trust His correction. You trust His chastisement. I just received a nasty letter from from somebody and, and in it and says, uh, and he's basically correcting me and it goes on and on, but basically it starts off and he says, fearing chastisement. So I'm not, I wrote back, You're not, I'm not the chastisement you should be concerned with. There's a chastisement. There's a wrath. But God chastises what? Those whom he loves. You love that. You, I want that correction. Come into this place of recognizing what God is doing in your life so you hear and you obey. But if you do sin, and is there anybody here who's been free of that? Anybody in this room that you're, you've reached the point where this really is all just kind of not needed anymore. I'm, I'm good. I would say that everybody in this room has, has the weakness of the body, the, the tiredness, the grumpy, the whine, the pine, the whatever goes on. We deal with all our issues. And it says, so therefore he says, if you do sin, if, if you do happen to have an issue, my little children, John writes, the one whom Jesus loved, 
First John chapter 2, 1 and 2. My little children. Don't you love the way it starts? My little children. That's me. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. My little children. It, it, Heather, you, you talk to all the little ones in the classroom. Right? My little children, right? Now, of course, he doesn't want you to stay like a little child. He wants you to, but he's speaking to my little children, the ones who I brought into being, my little children. Hear, hear his spirit. Hear his heart. Hear the heart of the spirit. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, meaning, why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? How many times they say, why don't we become like the New Testament church? And they were free from all this. Who's he writing to? The New Testament church. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins, as we covered in, in classes in time past. That covering, he's our mercy seat, our covering. The, the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. That same word, propitiation, is the same word for mercy seat. Coming in and realizing that he not only is the covering, but he took those sins away. The expiation, he took them away. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He's the advocate. Come into this place of recognizing that he's our advocate. God Almighty, Christ, is, is in the right hand of God, seated at the right hand. He's our advocate interceding for us, yes? In the same time, he has sent forth his Holy Spirit who is here working in your life down here. And the two are as one, the three are as one, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and you're now in that mix. You will be one as I am one with the Father. You're in that mix. What is holiness? You're becoming one with the mix. You're becoming one of the same spirit. So he wants you to act the same way. Perfect as he is perfect. His mind, his heart, that you turn away from the flesh, turn away from self, turn away from self-will and self-rule, and you turn to him. I want God. But it's so easy to get caught up on all the sports and the job and the emails and the relationship and the neighborhood parties and the things that are going on, and we see things all from the natural. But what, what's the Bible say? Faith doesn't go by the natural, doesn't go by appearance. Faith sees where the appearances don't go. And you say, I see by faith. Faith sees the promises of God, sees the spirit world unfolding, sees what's going on, hears the spirit stirring in our lives, and even hear the still small voice and tells you what to do. Yes? Here's, that's what God is doing. Let me just read the scripture to you. I didn't put it down in any PowerPoint slide or anything, but in 1 John chapter 5, Verse 18, let me read this also to you for the sake of a little bit extra clarity on some of these things. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, he writes this. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. What did we just talk about? We all still have weakness, sin, difficulties, and if you do sin, you have an advocate. But you must repent, turn, trust in, yes? You don't assume you confess, make it right. You don't conceal matters, you confess. You come forth, you confess Christ, you confess who you are, you confess things. But if you do sin, you have an advocate. But here he's writing in just a little, another chapter. It says in verse 18, For we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Why is he saying that? Because your new creation, your inner man, is not the one sinning. Yes? Because that is born of God. It, you, that your new man is not tempted by the things of the world. Who is tempted? Your old nature, your old soul, your old body, your old, that is the part, and seeks dominance, and keeps trying to gain the upper hand, and seeks dominance in your life, and, and you want that desire, and you want to be seen, and you shall, don't let them get away from that, and you assert yourself, and you stand tall, and you fight for your, for your rights, and anything to, oh yes, you want that, oh yeah, they like you, oh that girl likes you, that guy likes you, oh my, and you give yourself to it. That's not your inner man, the man born of Christ. That is, that's the old nature. That's the old body. That's the old ways. Yes? But he, so he's writing and saying that, that it's not your, the, the inner man. That's not the man born of Christ. Is perfect. And perfection is being brought forth out of you. Made perfect. Made mature. Made one with Christ. That's not the one with sin. That's why he says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. The born again part of you, the inner man maturing, is free, getting free from sin. Pulling away from sin. Sanctified. I don't want that in my life. The things that I used to do, I don't want to do. More so, by the Spirit. You now have the power to say no what you could never say no to. And you can now say yes to what you could never say yes to. 
I want holiness. I want the God of my life. I did, when I was growing up, did you think I, was, I, I spent my time wanting to say, I can't wait till someday I spend my whole life in church. Do, do you think I grew up that way? Do you think that I sat back and said, you know, someday I'm going to spend all day in church. It was going to church. It was like, oh, church, right? Just kneel down, stand up, sit down, kneel down, stand up, sit down. Da, 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 do all the things. Drag in your church. Drag. And all of a sudden, it's, I come alive. My whole life is now what? Church. Church. When I got saved, all of a sudden, I'm pulling out my old Bible. I said, I think I have a Bible. I, I used to look at it when I was a kid. I'm, all right? Sat, and it's, I'm understanding it. Are those my old eyes? No, it's a new eyes that loves the truth. I, I want to dive into the truth. I want it to, I'm out cutting wood, splitting wood, and, and I'm getting words from the Lord. I'm running in the house, writing them down. I am the way. He says, I am. He's the I am. I'm writing things down. These are all things that you're all aware of, but when I, I'm three days saved, I, this is all new to me. I'm running in. I'm writing things down. I, I didn't even know where to, I opened my Bible. The first book was Ephesians. I don't even know, I didn't know how to say it. And I'm reading them. It's making sense to me. It's ministering to me. I'm calling my family. I'm telling them what happened. A new creation. That new creation in Christ is not the one sinning. It's not tempted by this world. Not, not in fearful of insecurity. Not wanting to be liked by the love of the world. That's your old nature. Warring against your new nature. Yes? And this body of sin has to be mortified and crucified so that you live in the body of Christ. That's what's taken place. And a sacrifice has been made once for all. Now you do the same thing. Sacrifice yourself. Sacrifice your self-will, your self-rule, your desires of the flesh. Sacrifice and mortify. Why? Because there's a promise worth living for. And there's a promise worth dying for. You want to die for this. There's a, there's a death that has eternal value. Hear me now. There is a death that has eternal value. And there's no other death but the one that you give to Him. And it gives you life and life everlasting. That you have the Christ in you. Think of what he says here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 22. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. To receive is to believe. To believe is to receive. I believe, I receive, I receive, I believe. I want the new nature, the Holy Spirit of joy, peace, and love. I want the fruit. You want the fruit of the Spirit to come in your life. Oh, the world is going to call you foolish. But as you've heard me say in time past, you are going to be in this life somebody's fool. Somebody. Either heaven is going to look upon you and say, you fool. Do you not know your soul is required of you tonight? You fool who cast away salvation. You foolish one. And the world will say, oh, you're my friend, my buddy, hey, let's run together. Or the world will call you a fool. You foolish. Spending your life in church. Gary Cody, what are you doing? Spending your life reading the Bible? Telling people about this myth, mystical and mythical stuff and just wasting your life? That's what my family told me. You're wasting your life. Throwing your life away. Throw away your job, your house, move your family away. What for? Irresponsible. What are you doing? Pursuing the promises of God at all cost. Coming to this place the scripture can find all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So therefore, brethren, what do we do? We live for God. What do we do with the... We want to live for the Lord. Therefore, he says in verse 19, coming to this, coming to this ending of, of tonight's class, when he says, therefore, brethren, the conclusion... Therefore, who is he talking to? Therefore who? Brethren. Those who have received Christ, have the Spirit. Those who have been awakened to His Spirit. Those who, as we've been talking about all along, the us, the brethren. The ones who belong to Christ, the special people. Therefore, brethren, what does he want you to have? What should you have? Boldness. 
Boldness comes by the Holy Spirit. Everything else is pride asserting itself. Hear me now. That's a good statement. Boldness only comes by the Holy Spirit. If anyone finds themselves confident, it's because they found a place of security where they can feel secure and safe and confident. They've aligned themselves with something where they can feel uh, outward, outward security. Boldness only comes by the Holy Spirit. Everything else is merely pride asserting itself. God has not yet put you in your fears. When a person says, well, I'm confident, I'm bold, and they're just asserting themselves. Pride is just inserting, inserting and asserting and putting on an air of confidence. But if the Holy Spirit puts them in their fears, you'll see what they really like. Boldness only comes by the Holy Spirit. And what is this great boldness that we now have? The boldness of verse 19 is to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. The blood has been shed. The blood has been sprinkled in heaven above. Not some earthly tabernacle of stone, gold, and silver, and wood. But the heavenly, the heavenly temple. The eternal realm that Christ entered in as the high priest according to Melchizedek. And entered in, not without blood. And sprinkled and shed his blood. Making a propitiation and an expiation of all sin. Past, present and future. No more an offense. That you can now come by the spirit. Believing in him. Receiving his spirit. You can now boldly walk into the holiest of places. Where before, what was it? Just a tent. And just a tent of a place. It darkened. Only one person, once a year, could enter in. Yes, the high priest. And not without blood. Or else what? If he entered without blood, what? Dead. But now you. Think of the honor, the privilege, the opportunity. But now you, me. We can boldly go. Come, not presumptuously and arrogantly, like I used to walk when I was in high school, you know. Yo, man, hey, Jesus. You know, you don't have to do that. You, don't, you can walk boldly, confidently into the presence of God. Abba, Father. Oh, you can come up to the very throne room of God when you take your last breath here. And your eyes closed to this world and your eyes by faith open to eternity. And you come to heaven's gate and you come to heaven's fortress of faith. And you come to a place where only the cloud of witnesses can be. And you come to this place and the holy angels are looking. And they look square at you and the devil is leering at you. And you all of a sudden look and you realize that, that uh, uh, the throne and the gates and, the, and you can boldly stand there. Full light of gospel looking at you. The fiery eyes of Jesus looking to every capillary of your soul. Devil can whisper and yell from the rooftops or whisper to your heart. What right do you have to be here? Well, I was a pastor. Yeah, that's going to work. Well, I gave all that to the... Yeah, that's going to work. Well, I kept going to church and I was faithful to my church. Yeah, that's going to work. You know what's going to work? My father wants to see me. My father wants to see me. I'm a child of God. And my father wants to see me. I can boldly come in to the throne room of grace. The father that I did not have is the father I have. And you can boldly go in and Jesus himself will introduce you to the one that no one has seen. Here he is. The one that gave you his seed, Christ, in you. Why would you and I want to deny Christ in me when he's made us the promise of God to see the Father? And I can call him Father. Jesus is the one who took my Father in heaven and said, here's how to pray. Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You have a place in the heart of God. Now live there. Don't deny him. Live there.
Don't prefer self and insecurities ways and prideful ways and unbelief and assume that everything's okay when he has given his own son to be sin for us. Let us not now be presumptuous before him. But let us boldly go into his throne room right now and say, Father, would you forgive me? I've been blowing it. I've been serving myself. Repent to the Father. Tell him. Just before I came up here, my 10-year-old grandson came up to me crying, shaking. Holy Spirit, again, I told you earlier, grinding on him. Papa, I'm a mess. I've been, I've been bad. And he, and he was. He confessed it all, opened his heart, went into his room. I said, go to your room afterwards, all, a half hour later. Talk to Jesus. He's crying to Jesus. Do you think that maybe God hears that? Hear Father in heaven comes back new. New. Clear conscience. Clean. Clear. I don't have to be this way. You don't have to be this way. Do you know where this goes? You don't have to be this way. You can actually be free of all that junk. You can be free of all the things that I had to overcome in my 30s and 40s. You can be free right now. Free of it. Because you have a Father in heaven. I'm not looking to be your daddy. I'm looking to introduce you to the one who cares for you. I'm not here to tell you that I can save you. I'm here to tell you you must be saved. I'm not here to sanctify you. I'm here to tell you you must be sanctified. I'm not here to love you. I'm here to tell you there's one who loves you. And this is what he looks like. Come into this place of knowing that God Almighty has given you the opportunity, the privilege to have boldness to enter the very holiest of places where Christ himself sits, as it says in Colossians chapter 3, where he's seated, the seated at the right hand of God. He's placed you there already, as he says in Ephesians chapter 2. You're seated in high places. You're already there. Therefore, you don't give yourself to the spirit of disobedience that's working in this world. And you overcome the lust of the flesh that are seeking to devour your soul, as he says in Ephesians 2, because you are seated with him. You've been raised up together with Christ. You're resurrected in Christ. You, he's given you his mind and his heart. And you have a Father in heaven. And the day is coming for you and the day is coming for me when you will be able to say, my Father in heaven. That's what you're living for. But you want him later? You must have him now. You want to live in eternity later? You must live eternity now. Here's the proving ground. Who belongs to Jesus? Haven't we seen over the past 14 years, even in our own little church body here, those who love the Lord, those who don't. Those who prefer self, those who don't. Those who love holiness, those who don't. Those who surrender fully, those who don't. Have we not seen it? Will you be those? As it says in Galatians 5, and I end it here, those who belong to Christ, those who are Christ, have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Therefore, let the sanctifying work come alive in you. And let him be your Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Father in heaven, thank you for this lesson plan. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the work that you'll do for whoever hears this, this teaching in, in latter years. Oh God, I pray that we would welcome the sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit and recognize we have a Father in heaven. And that you've given us this honor, this privilege to be one with you. That we would live in Christ. That we would allow, Lord, and yield and surrender our selfish ways to the things of the Spirit. And we would want the things of God and mature in you and become one with you. Let us not get captivated with peripheral things of this world. Let us not get caught off guard with unrest that is robbing this world of its peace. And let us not get caught in the lies, the deceptions, and the fears of this world. But let us fully trust in you right here, right now, to start with our new life. Oh, Father in heaven, as the hourglass fills and comes to a place where times will be no more, I pray, Lord, that we come alive in the Spirit, that we fight the good fight of faith, that we pursue love and pursue holiness and chase after the kingdom of God. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. 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 amen and amen. God bless you. As you ponder on this teaching, as you pray or as you sing or however the Lord moves in our hearts to bring this to conclusion or maybe it's just God bless as we ponder it in our own homes. But whatever the Lord tells you to do, I encourage you, hear him. It's worth it. God bless.